as president, I'll defend our cherished way of life. These are images of Donald Trump's America today. In Joe Biden's America, you and your family will never be safe. America has always been full of hope and resolve. Go and vote. Good morning. I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Oh, my God, this day is finally here. Election Day. And you're watching First Look, Washington Post Live's one-stop shop for news and analysis. And let's go right to the man himself, chief national national correspondent and veteran political reporter and editor, Dan Baltz. Dan, as always, thanks for, for getting us started. Jonathan, great to be with you. Happy Election Day to you and uh, to everybody watching. So um, starting at about around 7 p.m. Eastern, we're going to be bombarded with numbers from different states, percentages of precincts that have reported votes counted. What are your expectations and what should we be looking out for when that hour hits? Well, I mean, I think the big question, Jonathan, is whether we're going to know relatively early, which means sometime late tonight, or whether we're not. And if we're not, we may be in for a long haul. I think that the early signs will come out of Florida, uh, North Carolina, and Georgia. Uh, the degree to which Joe Biden does well in those states, which is to say, if he can flip those states, um, then we have one kind of election. If he does not, um, then we move to the northern states, which will report later tonight and probably much later in the week because of the so many mail-in ballots that can't be processed until today uh, and counted from here forward. So um, I, I think everybody's looking at the same thing. How does Florida go? I think the Biden campaign feels um, a little less optimistic about getting Florida. I think that they feel that Georgia has some opportunity for them and certainly South uh, North Carolina has been a, a key battleground all along. So that's where we are this morning. Mm -hmm. Can we talk more about the states and in terms of how fast they count their count their ballots? All for the last few days, folks have been focused on Pennsylvania and how long it takes uh, the Commonwealth to count up its votes. But when it comes to the three states you mentioned, Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia, do they have reputations for counting their ballots quickly? Well, certainly Florida and. Uh... North Carolina do, although uh, we, we all remember 2000 and the 36 days that it took to figure out who actually won Florida, and would, that's still in dispute, obviously. Um, Georgia, somewhat slower, but I think that, you know, the keys will be those two uh, states, North Carolina and Florida, because they do have a reputation of counting relatively quickly, again, which is to say um, sometime into the evening. Um, and and we will we will then get a pretty good clue of kind of what the nature of this landscape is likely to look like. I mean, another state that will not, that could count relatively quickly, but won't come until much later is Arizona, another battleground mm -hmm. that, uh, that Biden has been going after. Um, and again, if that were to flip, that would be a significant uh, situation also, but that we won't know until much, much later and perhaps not until tomorrow. Dan, if Florida flips, is that game over for President Trump? Flips from red to blue. Jonathan, mathematically, not quite. He still might be able to, to make it, um, but boy, it sure makes it enormously difficult. Um, and I think everybody, everybody knows that, which is one reason that the Biden campaign uh, has focused as much attention as they have on that state. It is, it is not in their calculus a must win, um, but if, if the president were to lose that, he would be in a deep, deep hole. Uh, Dan, then let's carry this out further. You've covered many presidential campaigns, many election nights. From your vantage point, is there a state that if President Trump loses it, he has lost the election definitively? Oh, I think if he loses the state of Texas, this, this is over. Um, 38 electoral votes, would put him, you know, would put him with basically no path to get there. Um, and again, what we have seen in Texas this fall and in the last few weeks with the early voting uh, is is something we've never seen before. I mean, they they passed their total vote of 2016 late last week. Um, the polls have been very close. I think the president has a small edge, and one would assume that given the recent history of Texas. 
Um, but it is a competitive state, and a couple of Democrats that I talked to over the weekend believe that Biden had a very good chance or a decent chance uh, to win the state. If that were to happen, uh, that, that would be the biggest thunderclap of the evening. Your educated guess, given the, the Democrats you talked to, and I'm sure plenty of Republicans you've talked to, how likely is it that that thunderclap actually produces lightning that flips Texas from red to blue? I, I, I'm still a bit of a skeptic about it, um, but, um, but, but people who are closer to it feel that, that it is possible. But I, I, if I were a Democrat, I would not pin my hopes on flipping Texas. If, if Texas flips, um, then we're, we're looking at a quite different election um, than some people might think. Um, I, I think one would have to assume that that is probably going to be in the president's column. But, uh, but again, the number of people who have voted, the, the enthusiasm that we can see, the energy that is there. Um, I, I think one big question in Texas, Jonathan, is what happens in the, in the Latino communities. And you saw uh, Kamala Harris go to South Texas uh, late last week to inject some energy into, into the voting there, which Democrats said they needed. So there's some big question marks about whether uh, Texas will actually flip this time, but it is competitive and that tells you something about the nature of this election. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a, a, a question this time related to Joe Biden and whether his, whether his campaign is dead. If he doesn't win, if Joe Biden does not win Pennsylvania, is it over for him? Not quite. I mean, if he, if it, let's say he were to lose Pennsylvania, but win uh, North Carolina, he would be able to get there. Um, but Pennsylvania is so much the key. I mean, that from the very beginning of the Biden campaign, uh, his, his senior people have always regarded Pennsylvania as kind of the linchpin of this election. In other words, as Pennsylvania goes, so goes the election. And so, and I think it's clear in both campaigns how vital they see that in uh, those electoral votes uh, in the calculus that gets them there. Um, in most of the, you know, the analyses of the election, Pennsylvania is seen as the tipping point state, the state that gets someone to 270 electoral votes. It's certainly the case for, for uh, Joe Biden. Uh, let, we've got less than two minutes left, so I, but I wanna talk to you about Senate races. Um, do you think that John Ossoff in his Senate race in Georgia and Reverend Raphael Warnock, also a Democrat in his Senate race in Georgia, do you think that they'll be able to crack the 50% threshold to prevent going to a runoff in January? I'd be surprised about that, but perhaps, again, Georgia, we can't quite tell at this point what's going to happen in Georgia. I, I know that there are Democrats who are pretty bullish about Biden's chances um, of carrying the state, and that, you know, that would give us an indicator of how those Senate races might go. But getting over that 50% margin might be, might be a, a challenge uh, for both of those races, in both of those Senate races. And then in South Carolina, Jamie Harrison, the former Democratic Party chairman in South Carolina, running to unseat the incumbent, Senator Lindsey Graham. They've been at certain points tied in the polls. Certainly, Harrison has outraised every quarter. Lindsey Graham, will that be enough for Harrison to achieve the impossible dream of unseating Lindsey Graham? Well, money's important, but it's not everything. And South Carolina is a very red state. Um, we did see a surprise in the first district in 2018 when the Democrats captured that. Um, so, you know, you can't rule out anything, um, but I think it is, a, it is a very, very big challenge for Jamie Harrison to actually unseat Lindsey Graham. I mean, the campaign has been, you know, so fiercely fought uh, Senator Graham is clearly on the defensive and, and Harrison on the offense, offensive. But, uh, but again, given the voting history of South Carolina, you know, that would, that would be the biggest upset of the evening. Dan, final question. If, if in one word, describe the 2020 presidential campaign. Uh, I'll give you two words, anxiety filled. I think this country is, I mean, no matter what side people are on, people are on edge this morning wondering what will, what will we know tonight? Uh, how quickly will we know it? Uh, and what will the next four years look like in America? And with that, Dan Baltz, we got to leave it there. Thank you very much for coming on First Look. And we absolutely look forward to your insights into election, election 2020 once the dust, once the dust settles. Thanks, Jonathan.
All right, let's go to the opinion side of the post and bring in my, my colleagues, columnists, Karen Tumulty and Henry Olson. Karen, Henry, welcome. Hello. Great to be here. <laughs> All right, Henry, I want... Ish, right? <laughs> Henry, I'm going to start with you because this past weekend you published your sixth biannual, biennial, I'm sorry, election uh, prediction essay, and you're bullish on the Democrats. You predict, you predicted a Biden win, that the Democrats would take the Senate and expand their majority in the House, um, and you attributed a Biden victory to quote common sense. Just that right there for Democrats who are watching, it might sound like this is Christmas morning and there are tons of presents under the tree. Give us your reasoning for this bullish assessment. Well, the biggest thing that a president has to do is persuade people that he deserves another four years. And that's always impacted uh, and reflected in the job approval rating. President Trump has never been over 50%. The first president in modern times to have never had 50% job approval. We know he can win the electoral college without winning the electoral, the popular vote. But in order to do that, he has to break 47, getting between 47 and 48 percent of the popular vote. He's only been at 47 percent job approval rating for six days in his entire presidency. Hmm. So it's common sense that when a president is, does not persuade Americans that he deserves another four years, and does not persuade Americans that he can deal with the crises that they are most concerned about, that they're not gonna give him that time. And in a time like today, where people are voting straight ticket, that drags the whole party down, not just President Trump. And so, I mean, I, I, your prediction, your presidential prediction, I'm like, okay, but you predict that the Democrats are going to take the Senate. So do you think that the president the, the president's relative unpopularity and the drag that that's going to have on down ballot races, that would be enough to say, help Jamie Harrison defeat Lindsey Graham in Ruby Red, South Carolina? I don't think so, because I think the president will still win South Carolina. One mm -hmm. of the things that's really telling in this election is that Senate candidates are polling roughly what the president does in every single uh, race with one or two exceptions. John James and Sarah Gideon tend to run, uh, not Sarah Gideon, uh, her opponent Susan Collins tend to run a couple of points ahead of the president. So the real question is, will the president carry their state? I'm predicting Democrats winning the Senate because I believe Joe Biden will win North Carolina, perhaps narrowly, but I think that will be enough to defeat Tom Tillis. But I don't think that Jamie Harrison will win. I don't think that MJ Hagar will win in Texas. But if I'm too pessimistic about the Democrats, if Biden's winning nationally by eight, nine or 10, then absolutely those states and other states like Kansas and Montana and Alaska start to come online as potential Democratic pickups as well. Karen, I would love to, to get your um, assessment of Henry's predictions. Do you think it'll pan out? And then I want to ask you about uh, Nancy Pelosi's battle plan. But first, your, your reaction to Henry's uh, biennial election prediction. Well, I would highly recommend that people go take a look at it because it is so well-reasoned. And if it does turn out to be the case, it's, it's a scenario that I think is very likely, I think it is going to raise what I think would ultimately be remembered as the two great enduring mysteries of the Trump presidency. The first is why a president who came to office without winning the popular vote never seemed to see any need to reach out beyond his base or to, to bring in voters in parts of the country that hadn't voted for him. And the second would be why the Republican Party, why the elders of this party never reacted to sort of pull this president at, at Pat, you know, back from the brink before he took the rest of them over the ledge with him. I mean, we saw this happen when they lost their House majority in 2018. And tonight there is a very, very good chance that they will, the Senate majority will go as well. Hmm. Well, talk more about the House, because you wrote about um, Speaker Pelosi's battle plan, about her caucus discipline and fundraising efforts. Talk more about that. 
Well, can, it's hard to remember almost that it was it was 11 months ago uh, at the height of the House impeachment vote where Republicans were getting up one after another saying, this is going to cost the Democrats their majority. President Trump said they're going to lose a lot of seats over this. Now, as we come into Election Day, you rarely hear impeachment even mentioned. And Nancy Pelosi had a very clear, very disciplined strategy here all along. She she made sure that her members focused hard on the issues that mattered most to their constituents, specifically health care. That was the issue that took them over the finish line in 2018. She did something no other speaker had ever done before, which is she awarded 18 subcommittee chairmanships to her freshman members, her first termers, the people who were gonna be most in danger of losing their seats tonight. She gave them a chance to sort of go back to their constituents and say, I am actually achieving things on issues that matter to you in your daily lives. And then finally, the Democrats in the House have just absolutely swamped the Republicans when it comes to money. And so that is one of the reasons that you don't even hear the House races really talked about that much now. I mean, with so much attention on, on the White House and the Senate, it does appear that, that the Democrats could actually be picking up as many as 15 seats in the House, maybe more. So are we really... So are we really looking at, I mean, Henry, you've predicted this. Karen, it sounds like you agree that we could be looking at one party rule in, in Washington, Democratic House, Democratic Senate, Democrat in the Oval Office at some point after tonight. That's not so far-fetched. Oh, I, I don't think it's far-fetched at all. Um, one of the things that might be a, a hitch in all of that is the president of the United States, um, who I think even as late as yesterday, still making noises about uh, not abiding by our our traditions since we formed as a republic of you know the peaceful transfer of power. How con how concerned um, are each of you that the president of the United States, if the election doesn't go his way? will do things to ensure that he wins, either going to court and trying to stop legally cast ballots or other things. Start with you, Henry. Well, I think, first of all, there are going to be legal efforts to follow the law. Um, and that is something that both Republicans and Democrats will be doing. Uh, but in, there's very little that the president can do. Uh, that We have a decentralized system of voting in the country. Uh, votes are counted and administered at a county and a municipality level. It's not like other countries where there's a central electoral commission that his appointees can just shut down the vote counting and start stuffing the ballot box. And I really do not think that Amy Coney Barrett and John Roberts and Brian and uh, Brett Kavanaugh want to go down in history as the people who swung a disputed election to Donald Trump without 100 percent clear legislative authority to do so. And it's pretty clear to me that uh, any disputes uh, about electoral colleges uh, or votes, uh, there is a process for that, a legal process that was passed in 1877 that gives Congress the final decision-making authority over disputes over state's electoral college. And my guess is that the originalist justices uh, on the court will defer to that and not give a final decision in favor of the president. And the president can stomp and storm all he wants, but I don't see that he's going to be able to stop a peaceful of transfer of power when the votes are finally all counted. Karen? Yeah, I just don't think the Supreme Court wants to go back to the situation that it found itself in in 2000. This is not something that that the justices think reflected well on them. And call me an optimist, but I think that if, if President Trump is defeated soundly, I think that that may be the moment where wiser heads in his party finally step up and say, you know, we've got to accept this. And um, once, you know, it appears that 
Donald Trump is is no longer in a position to sort of, you know, kill kill them all with the lash of his Twitter feed, um, perhaps we would then see the the sort of wiser heads, the elders of the Republican Party step in. Uh, okay, Karen. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I hope you're right on that. Somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's so that's um, the president. But now what really concerns me are the president's supporters and whether they will uh, will accept the election results if it if if in fact President Trump loses at the ballot box. I'm thinking about what happened over the weekend in Texas when a Biden Harris bus was surrounded by a caravan of Trump supporters with their Trump flags waving, trying to run one car and escort an escort car off the road. How concerned are you that even if the the legal wheels uh, turn in the way that they're supposed to, that the president's supporters will lash out in ways that he can't control? I'm not concerned. Um, I'm more concerned of what's going on in major cities. You know, I'm not in Washington, D.C. today, but uh, buildings are being boarded up and there have been for right. weeks people online who oppose Donald Trump, who are putting up addresses of Donald Trump supporting organizations and individuals to be who knows what happens on election day. Um, I am more concerned about that getting out of control. You know, with respect to nonviolent uh, support, you know, many Democrats never accepted the president's victory, uh, calling it uh, you know, Russian collusion or interference. Many Republicans will think that a presidential defeat is a result of voter fraud, but most people are decent people. And I think we'll see within the uh, a few weeks of the election when polls are taken is that most Republican voters will accept that Joe Biden, if he does win, was legitimately elected. And even if they don't think that he'll be a very good president, I think this is much more of a hullabaloo about little or nothing with little or nothing being paid to the way in which people on the left are already organizing for uh, things that could easily f turn into violence on, uh, later tonight. I don't know. I'm a little concerned, Karen, about folks on the far right with, you know, with their guns, you know, going to polling places uh, and potentially, you know, being upset that the president hasn't won re-election if that is the case. But your reaction to what Henry brought up, you know, here in Washington, um, stores and businesses, not all of them, but a lot of them are boarded up. I was in New York over the weekend. They're boarding up. And, and no, that's happening around the country. What message does that send about, you know, faith in the election? Yeah, I think that is why we should hope that that there is an outcome that is clear and decided relatively quickly, not necessarily tonight, but something that doesn't stretch on for weeks and weeks, because I think it would be most dangerous if if this drags on, if it's really close, if it, you know, essentially comes down to hand to hand combat. Mm hmm. Wait, but Karen, you know, to to that point about, you know, it's not going to be decided tonight, but the president of the United States has already said several times now in the last week that it must be decided tonight and that if it's not decided tonight, it's fraudulent. Well, that's I mean, absurd. And every time he says that, it, people point out that is absurd. That is not the way our elections are decided. And I think there's been enough of an education effort here that all but the, the kind of most fringy characters understand that if it takes a day or two days to count the votes, that that's because people are being careful, not because they're, somebody's out there trying to commit fraud. Henry. I mean, I, I hear what you're I hear what you're saying, Karen. And actually, that's something you were saying as well, Henry. But please uh, allay my fear that, you know, even though we've got this process that's been in place for a couple centuries and this is going to be put it's going to be put to the test tonight, but that there are there are there are people out there, uh, and I'm thinking of the ones with the guns, who might act out. The president is probably going to come out tonight and say he won. 
Uh, he'll most certainly say something on Twitter and keep banging away at it until you know, uh, you know, the results are certified, which might be, to Karen's point, two days later. I guess my question here is, how do we hold the nation together during that period um, if there's no if there's no clear clear winner tonight, but maybe in a couple of days, how do we hold the nation together so that the wheels do not completely spin off the bus? Well, I think it requires some restraint on both sides. It requires people on the Republican Party side to uh, express faith in the vote counting process. Uh, it requires people on the Democratic side not to uh, overly claim. Uh, fear, uh, victory, if it's clearly not uh, clear yet, and could if the president does better than expected, it really could come down to Pennsylvania, where votes will take a few days. I think uh, all responsible media will go along with that, including people at Fox and Newsmax and, uh, and so forth, because it's clear to any reasonable person that this isn't unusual, that votes do get counted after election day. Uh, and uh, as one writer pointed out, there have been many times in our history when we didn't know the winner on election day. I remember in my youth, 1968, uh, it wasn't called until nine or 10 in the morning uh, for Richard Nixon because it took that long to decide that Illinois had gone his way. And that was in an age when everybody voted on election day. So I think the fears are just that, fears. Uh, and I think when the reality comes, it's going to be much, much easier and much calmer than many people expect. You know, to that point, to yeah, that sorry. point, um, I saw something that I found very encouraging this morning on Twitter, which was that the Republican and Democratic chairman in Dallas County in Texas issued a joint statement telling people to be patient while the votes are counted. And I think that there is a real opportunity here for election officials close to the ground to sort of reassure people that partisan differences aside, they know what they're doing, they're being careful, and that this is how it's supposed to work. Can I get each of you to um, sort of wax poetic about the fact that you know we woke up this morning to find out that more than 100 million people have already voted in this election. What does that say about um, who we are at this moment in, in our country's history? You know, there is, so, there is so much ahead. to despair. There's so much to despair over about what our politics have, have become. But it really is when you see people getting out there just determined to express their political will, despite all the efforts that have been made in, in various localities to make it hard to vote, despite a virus that has killed over 200,000 people, it, it really does show you that people on both sides believe that the stakes of this election are absolutely enormous and that they want their voices to be heard. Henry? Yeah, I think that what you're seeing is people hoping that we can solve our differences peacefully. And that's what they're trying to do through the ballot box. I think we're going to have a massive record turnout. Some people say 150. I actually think it could be as large as 175 million. I think it'll be the largest turnout as a percentage of eligible voters in uh, uh, 100 years. And that speaks to passions, uh, but it also speaks to hope. And I think there will be a lot more hope and a lot less passion as people see the votes being counted, no matter how much they may be disappointed in the result. They will know that for all of the talk, we will have had a peaceful election in very, very fraught circumstances that have come off really without too much of a hitch. Uh, we have less than two minutes left. Um, I know you each have written about the campaign and predictions and things, but tonight, what is the one thing you are going to pay attention to that will be either red flag, red alert, siren for you, big signal about this election? Henry, you go first. I have been, I have spreadsheets that will track where the early vote is in comparison on a county level basis in the three southeastern states to where Joe Biden needs to go. I'll know as soon as those things come up, whether he's hitting or exceeding his marks. 
and uh, president has to win all three states realistically. Theoretically, he could do better in the Midwest than in the Southeast, but practically that's not going to happen. Uh, and if he doesn't win all three of those states, it's game over. Name the three states. Are you talking about Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan? No, I, the three you... states he has to win game over are Florida, Georgia, and North Carolina. I mean, theoretically, Florida, as you pointed out, he could win the three North three Midwestern states and lose the Southeastern states, but we know with the partisan lean, that's not going to happen. He has to win all three of those states. They report, they close by 7.30. They're efficient places. They'll have early votes out by 8.30. We'll have a very good sense whether a presidential victory is possible by 8.30 Eastern time. Oh, that now see, that's the nugget I'm looking for. I'm writing that down, 8.30 <laughs> Eastern time, Florida, North Carolina, Georgia. Karen Tumblety, last word to you. Um, I, Florida, I just feel like it'll it'll tell us whether we have a late night or an early night. But I am also going to be looking as a native Texan. Um, mm. I'm skeptical that Texas flips. I and I don't think John Cornyn is in trouble. What I am watching in Texas is whether the Texas House flips. That is going to have enormous consequences just around the corner because we will be looking at reapportionment. All it's almost oh, on yes. us. And with that, we are out of time. Karen, Henry, thank you so much for coming back to Washington Post Live's first look. Thank you, Jonathan. Great to be here. Oh, and hang in there, because it's going to be a late night. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in. Washington Post Live will be back today at 1 p.m. Eastern time for Election Daily with Bob Costa, featuring Florida Senator Rick Scott, Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman and Nevada Senator, I'm sorry, Nevada Senator Catherine Cortez Mastro. And I'll be back tomorrow with First Look to break the election results down with Dan Baltz, Ruth Marcus, Hugh Hewitt. We will all be bleary eyed and tired, but so that means it's just going to be more hilarious and fun. Once again, I'm Jonathan Capehart, opinion writer for The Washington Post. Thank you very much for starting your day with First Look.